Hi, and welcome to Crash Course Cryosphere. I'm Simon. I'm Tom. And this week, I'm going to be looking at the physics of stress and strain and looking at the umbrella field of rheology. Whereas I will be looking at the internal deformation of ice and how this helps glaciers flow. Previously, we discussed that an important factor in mass balance is the movement of ice from the accumulation zone uphill to the ablation zone downhill. Glacier flow transfers ice from high elevation accumulation areas to low elevation ablation areas. And this flow is the reason why glaciers are particularly effective at sculpting and changing the landscape, creating everything from huge U-shaped valleys to terminal moraines. Why am I telling you all this? Is it because we lost some of our footage? <laughs> Absolutely not. But just how does all of that terrestrial ice move down slope, Tom? Part of our answer needs to look at individual ice crystals and how they behave when stacked upon one another hundreds if not thousands of metres deep. We do this through the two concepts of stress and strain. And we look at these two concepts under the umbrella of rheology. Rheology is quite simply how a given material responds to a given stress and strain. Now for this, we really need Simon's help because it's time to get into some more physics. Whoa, 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 Tom, okay. You've used a whole bunch of new words there. We, we're kind of going to need to define what they mean. We're going to need to go on a definition spree here. Stress is defined as the force per unit area. Easy to remember because physicists who deal with forces are always under a lot of stress. At the base of a glacier, the normal stress acting on the bed is due to the weight of the ice above it. Strain is defined as the relative change in the size of an object in response to a given stress. So strain is the change in the length scale of an object divided by the original length scale of that object. Strain rates are defined in terms of velocity gradients, so how quickly that change in length scale is taking place. And there are lots of kinds of strains, but we're not going to go into that complexity here. Rheology, then, is the study of how different substances respond to given stresses and strains. And in particular, we're interested in the yield strength, so how much stress and strain an object can take before it deforms. This yield strength is determined by a whole number of different factors which we don't have time to talk about here. But if you'd like to learn, there's a link down there in the description to further reading. A powerful framework for understanding glacier dynamics, in other words, how the ice moves over time, is what's known as the force balance. This is the balance between the driving stresses of the weight of ice, and the mass of ice under gravity, and the pushback, the resistive stresses due to the bed and the walls of the valley in which the glacier is being contained. Now, in an idealised situation, these two are balanced. Balance, but glaciers move over time, so clearly some of the time this isn't the case. Now we've got that sorted, I'm going to hand back over to the gravel monkey. So using this we find that under long time scales, ice is actually a plastic material. This means that it will deform under force permanently without breaking. This may be counterintuitive if you're used to finding ice as a brittle material, for example as a puddle. Now it's not to say ice does not still behave brittly, it still does in terms of iceberg carving, but fundamentally, under long time scales, in the masses we find it, it is a plastic material. And it's this plastic and its ability to deform that is so crucial to glacier flow. So what force is a glacier responding to? Well, actually, it's responding to its own weight. The stress experienced under certain thickness of ice is given by this equation, where rho, the p-looking guy, is the density of the ice, g is the Earth's gravitational acceleration, and h is the thickness above a certain point. If the ice we're considering was a parallel slab on a flat plane, then of course we wouldn't see any movement, all the force is directed immediately down. However, this isn't the case in reality, and most glaciers are located on a slope of some kind. This introduces a downslope component to the stress, known as shear stress, and fundamentally, this is what's causing ice to flow. According to Newton's third law, we know there must be an opposing force. In glacial systems, this is primarily basal drag. Basal drag is quite simply the friction that is generated as the ice flows over whatever surface it is on. Additional force comes from friction with the sidewalls and longitudinal forces from up and downstream ice. OK, so what we're trying to do here is demonstrate all those processes we discussed in action. In this bowl, I've got a whole bunch of plaster of Paris that I'm currently agitating to try and get the air bubbles out. And we're hoping this is a viscous enough solution that uh, it will behave like a glacier when we pour it down this Icelandic valley system. In the valley at the base here, we've got a small overdeepling at the back, a general ledge, and then a sudden acceleration down onto the front, where hopefully we'll get a Piedmont lobe type formation. As ever with our demonstrations, we'll see what actually happens. 
Okay, so now we're going to pour the glacier into the mountains. Never done this before, so let's see what happens. No, oh, it's too viscous. Fortunately, it looks like it started to set, so we're going to try and add some water to it. You can see the idea of what's supposed to happen here around our massive cake <laughs> of too thick plaster of Paris. But it's slowly creeping down the hillside under its own weight. And now, for just an extra bit of hillside assistance, we're going to push it down into the valley and just scoop it up a bit. As it spills out the bottom of the valley, it spreads out onto the flat plain. And just for the sake of artistry, I'm going to smooth the top a bit. So now we have our glacier in place, and as you can see, our demonstrations are starting to follow a pattern now of minor success followed by minor disaster, and we at least have a glacier in place that's kind of spreading out in a Piedmont lobe at the bottom. Now, up at the top here, where we saw the overdeepening, what's happening is the force is pushing down and into the overdeepening, and then the ice comes up and over the lip. As we move down the glacier, that force is angled down the slope and is pushing the ice down. When we reach the bottom here, as you can actually see with the plaster and Paris as well, the slope suddenly stops, you end up on a flat plain. And due to that, this is why you get this lobate form at the end, as the ice comes down off the slope and just spreads out onto the flat plain. Having just added some crevasses in with a piece of cardboard, we've, I've concentrated the crevasses at the lip of the overdeepening and again at the downslope break here. This is because obviously at these points, the longitudinal stresses increase and the ice cracks apart. Remember, ice, whilst plastic, is still fundamentally brittle in many ways. Right, with that done, the light failing and plaster of Paris caking my hands, we'd better get on. The deformation of ice in response to stress can occur through either creep or fracture. We know that ice is a plastic material and it will respond to the stress in the ways we've already discussed. This deformation is measured as the strain, which is a unitless measure of the displacement. We can also discuss this in terms of strain rate, which is a measure of strain over time. The amount of strain that takes place for a given stress is described by Glenn's flow law. Simon! Don't worry, Tom. I'm here. It's all going to be fine. We're going to talk through this equation, which, to give it its full title, by the way, which I think it deserves, is Nye's generalization of Glenn's flow law. This equation here isn't anything to be scared of. Maths isn't here to intimidate us, it's actually here to help us in our understanding of the natural world. Often people find maths hard, and I personally think that's because they think it's hard. Once you realise that maths is actually quite easy, you suddenly find it easy. And the first step to that is to stop being intimidated by something like this. Even Tom can do it. All this equation is saying is how the rate of change of strain in the system depends on the stresses in the system, plus a whole bunch of other numbers and constants that come from the geology. To break down this equation from left to right then, on the left hand side we have what looks like an E, but it's not. It's actually the letter epsilon, which is a Greek letter. We use Greek letters in science sometimes because we run out of normal letters, and sometimes for historical reasons. In this case, it refers to the strain of the system. Well, actually not quite. It refers to the effective strain of the system, because underneath the epsilon there's a capital letter E, which refers to the fact that it's the effective strain. Now, above our strain, we have a little dot. That dot is just a very lazy way that we describe the rate of change of something. If you have x with a dot above it, that means the rate of change of x. So, what we're looking at here is how the strain changes in time. Physicists are lazy, we love doing things with shortcuts, so a little dot, top notch. That's what we have on the left hand side. And then this equals some number a. Now a is what we call a parameter, it might not necessarily represent something physically directly, but it can depend on variables. And in this case a very strongly depends on the temperature, in fact it exponentially depends on the temperature. So if you change the temperature of your ice, your glacier a little bit, you change a a lot. And what we're doing is timesing that by this thing on the right, this T looking guy. This again is another Greek letter, it's not actually T, it's tau. And tau here represents the stress. But wait, it doesn't, because we have a capital letter E underneath it, which means it's the effective stress. And above it we have a little N. If N was to be replaced by 2, you could recognise this straight away, it would just be 
tau squared. It's just the power of tau. Now, in geology, we like to sort of match equations to the data. We make assumptions. So it actually turns out that n is a, around 3. 3 is a pretty good approximation, but it's just a number. It's just tau approximately cubed. So the rate of change of the strain in the system is equal to some number that depends on the temperature, strongly depends on the temperature, times the stress of the system. Note, by the way, that A doesn't just depend on the temperature. It actually depends on other things like the water content, the impurities in the water, and the size of the ice crystals. The key takeaway from this equation is this, that as you decrease the temperature of ice, or your glacier, the ice starts behaving less like a plastic deformable thing and more like a solid. This is similar to having a chocolate bar in your back pocket. It's no longer solid, but a bit gooey. Whereas if you put the chocolate bar back in the fridge, it's gonna get colder and colder and more and more solid, all without undergoing a phase change. Due to this viscosity, the actual method by which deformation occurs is by ice creep. This is movement within or between ice crystals. Of course, in reality, you have impurities and water content that means that this perfect model does not always work. It is important to consider that the total movement strain experienced at the surface of a glacier is cumulative. Ice creep is occurring at all levels throughout the glacier. And perhaps unsurprisingly, it's at its greatest at the base where the pressure is also greatest. If we assume all of the above to be true, we have a problem. According to what we've just discussed, the rate of flow should only be millimeters to centimeters per year. But we have ice streams that are moving at 25 kilometers a year. Additionally, we also see lots of seasonal variation. Glaciers often flowing faster in summer than in winter, but the depth of the ice column is remaining relatively the same, so that can't be explained by the mechanism of ice creep. So have we got ice creep wrong, or is it actually the case that there's other processes at work here that are serving to accelerate the ice in ways that we haven't yet discussed? This item must be cool because I've been allowed gloves because I've been so enthusiastic <laughs> about touching this. You have killed an alien for us. <laughs> Yeah. What is this? Well, OK, maybe it's not an alien. Oh, um, well, me. maybe there's a clue, because I maybe we can read this. It says, try wizard tournament on it. Any the wiser? Um, is this a port key? <laughs> Close. Uh, no, what it is, it's part of, uh, well, it's called a DOM, which is a digital optical module. So it works with light. And it's part of an array that is used to detect neutrinos that lives at the South Pole. So underneath the ice in the South Pole, for a kilometre cubed, there are loads of these things, and they're strung up, like so, like pearls on a string. They go down, they go across, and like I say, a kilometre cubed. And they all speak to each other, and they're there to detect neutrinos. So it's a bit of physics. So yeah, neutrinos are these really ghostly particles that there's, I think the statistic is there's a million going through your thumbnail at any given time. They basically totally don't interact with matter. They're not like electrons or protons that have big signatures. So detecting them is a really difficult thing. Mm -hmm. and so there's a huge physics experiment going on at the, the South Pole. Um, a kilometre cubed is a very big experiment. Yeah, it, it's called the CERN of the polar regions, and it, it's on that kind of scale, really. And it's been hijacked by gravel monkeys like Tom uh, <laughs> to do geological science, because while it's detecting neutrinos, because it's a kilometre on the surface by a kilometre, but then it also goes down by a kilometre, these things are being sort of sheared by the movement of the ice. And so you're actually learning a lot about the, the movement of ice underneath the surface, but by a very roundabout route. Yeah, but it's really precise because particle physics has yeah, to be I mean, fairly it's... precise. Um, yeah, and it's kind of an unexpected benefit of it that you've got yeah, it's, it's <laughs> this extra data. For... So it's been used to find out quite a lot about how the shape of the, the landmass underneath the ice works. And because it's embedded in a glacier, because of the qualities of the ice in a glacier, uh, which means it's really good for the optical properties, um, yeah, it's data that, how else would you have got that? It, yeah. It's stuff that really is novel. How did they get it down? How do you, how do you drill down? <laughs> uh, what they did, they used hot water. So it's very the, pure hot water to make the holes and then drop them in. Just for a kilometre straight, straight yeah. down. And the other question, of course, is why is it called the Triwizard Tournament? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a good point. Um, each of the groups of these has a theme. So it's part of the Harry Potter themed group of, of DOMs. Yeah. What would you call them? I reckon Star Wars would have Star to be Wars one. Star Wars has to be one. I mean, you have to be, you're dealing with physicists. Yeah. So Star Wars, Star Trek, 
uh, Lord yeah. of the Rings is so another... it's probably Babylon 5 I mean we're going pretty yeah. hardcore here yeah uh, Firefly yeah uh, I think 2 <laughs> by 2 hands of blue but mm. this is just so cool I, I just kind of want to take it apart and, and look at the electronics but I won't because please don't. I've got in trouble for touching things before yeah although actually this one the reason we got one at all is because it was faulty so that's why we were able to have one because each one represents a fairly hefty and quite expensive bit of kit mm. This week, we covered that rheology is the science of stress and strain, and that stress and strain are how we think about a material's behaviour as it responds to pressure, that ice is a plastic material on long timescales. It retains brittle behaviour, but ultimately behaves as a very, very viscous plastic solid, like a half-melted chocolate bar. That Glenn's flow law describes how the rate of change of the effective strain experienced by ice depends on the temperature of the ice and the stress that it's experiencing, but, as Tom said in his cliffhanger ending, glaciers move faster than the equations and processes that we've discussed this week can account for. Why? You have to tune in next time to find out. Well, I hope you enjoyed all of that. Thank you very much for watching this series. If you have any questions about the stuff we talked about this week, then Tom and I will be answering your questions down there in the comments. So if you have any misconceptions, something you're worried about, about this series, not about life in general, then Tom and I will try and answer those questions for you. There's also links to further reading in the description, so you wish to take your understanding further, which you should because this stuff's awesome. We'd like to thank all of these people for helping make this series possible. We really couldn't have done it without you guys. In particular, the Recover Project at the University of Exeter for helping fund this, and the Scott Polar Research Institute here in Cambridge for accommodating us and being so incredibly helpful. Thank you for watching. There are more icy adventures awaiting next week. <laughs>